Our scripture for today is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning of verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, Whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even one's own life cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. If one of you wanted to build a tower, wouldn't you first sit down and calculate the cost to determine whether you have enough money to complete it? Otherwise, when you have laid the foundation but couldn't finish the tower, all who see it will begin to belittle you. They will say, here's the person who began construction and couldn't complete it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down to consider whether his 10,000 soldiers could go up against the 20,000 coming against him? And if he didn't think he could win, he would send a representative to discuss terms of peace while his enemy was still a long way off. In the same way, none of you who are unwilling to give up all of your possessions can be my disciple. This is the word of God for the people of God. Jesus is in serious need of a marketing team or at least a public relations agent. You can't be a Christian unless you hate your family. This does not sound like Jesus. Aren't we supposed to love everyone, especially our families? We certainly are. When Jesus teaches us to love our neighbor, our closest neighbors are our families. So what does Jesus mean? It's easy to misunderstand Jesus here. It's a problem of our not comprehending how the words love and hate were used in Hebrew thought. Jesus was teaching in Aramaic and Semitic languages. The words love and hate are not necessarily used in an emotional sense, but can be used in the sense of making a choice. The prophet Malachi, speaking for God, says, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. God does not hate anyone. But what the words love and hate meant in that context is that God had chosen Jacob or Israel as his special people, but had not chosen Esau or Edom. Jesus is not saying we should hate anyone, especially our families, but Jesus is saying we may have to make a choice. When James and John left their father's fishing business, they were making a choice to follow Jesus. We all make choices. Perhaps you've heard the story of Bill Gates meeting God. God said, well, Bill, I'm really confused on this one. I'm not sure whether to send you to heaven or to hell. After all, you enormously helped society by putting a computer in almost every home in the world, and yet you created that ghastly Windows operating system. I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to let you decide where you want to go. God said it might help you decide if you took a peek at both places. Shall we look at hell first? Bill was amazed. He saw a clean, white, sandy beach with clear waters. There were thousands of beautiful men and women running around, playing in the water, laughing and frolicking about. The sun was shining and the temperature was perfect. This is great, said Bill. If this is hell, I can't wait to see heaven. God said, let's go. And off they went to heaven. Bill saw puffy white clouds and a beautiful blue sky with angels drifting about, playing harps and singing. It was nice, but surely not as enticing as hell. Bill thought for a moment and decided, God, I do believe I would prefer to go to hell. As you wish, God said. Two weeks later, God decided to check up on the late billionaire to see how things were going. He found Bill shackled to a wall, screaming amidst the hot flames in a dark cave, he was being tortured by demons with pitchforks. How you doing, Bill? God asked. Bill responded with anguish and despair. This is awful. This is not what I expected at all. What happened to the beach and the beautiful woman playing in the water? Oh, that, said God. That was the screensaver. <laughs> in our passage, Jesus is saying, you may have to choose between following me and loving your wife or your parents or your children. You, you may even have to choose between being my disciple or 
wanting to stay alive. You need to be willing to give up everything and everyone you love to follow me. Isn't Jesus being a bit harsh? Not at all. He's being loving and honest. He saw the large crowd following him, and all he can picture is all those people hanging from crosses. He knows that they misunderstand what he's about. They are seeing Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, the one who will be king like David and drive out the despised Romans. He would set up the kingdom of Israel so that they would be free and independent again. They are following Jesus to support his forming an army. They are ready to fight. But Jesus is gathering a community of love that marches to the beat of a different drummer. Jesus looks out over the crowd of men and women and children and says, you better count the cost. I'm going to end up on a cross. Is that what you're prepared to do? You've got to be willing to give up everything to become a Christian. Jesus' honest answer and his warning come true in the lives of thousands of martyrs throughout the ages, including 10 of the original 12 apostles, according to Christian tradition. But even today, many people suffer because they identify as followers of Christ. People's property has been confiscated by authoritative regimes. I have friends whose property in India, which was a Christian school, was taken over by Hindu authorities not long ago. Churches have been confiscated by governments in places like Cuba and the Soviet Union. In Cuba, two years ago, two pastors' houses where their churches met were bulldozed because their preaching was irritating local government officials. Our former district superintendent, Rini Hernandez, was a prisoner in a work camp in Cuba for two years as a young man because he was a Christian. Bob Fu was imprisoned for his work as a house church pastor in China. Peter Jacek, a Christian humanitarian worker in Czech National, spent 445 days in a Sudanese prison. Tara was the daughter of a prominent Pakistani. She was beaten to the brink of death. She was locked in her room as a prisoner without food or medical attention. Why? because she was caught with a Bible. Gladys' husband and sons were burned alive by village zealots, but today Gladys still travels as an Australian missionary who spreads the message of forgiveness and healing across India. There were more Christians martyred for their faith in the 20th century than all previous centuries combined. The century is not looking any better for many Christians in many places. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in other countries who, because they are loyal to Christ, end up losing family, friends, their careers, their possessions, and in some cases, even their lives. I thank God we live in a country where we have freedom of religion and freedom of speech, so I'm not concerned about talking freely about Jesus Christ this morning or about this message going out over the Internet. In our nation, we probably will never have to face anything like martyrdom or torture, as some people do. Most of us have not had our families turn against us because of our desire to follow Jesus. As some of you know, I studied at the Ecumenical Institute for Theological Research in Jerusalem. While we lived there, Yvonne and I were invited to attend an American Thanksgiving in Gaza by some expatriates. This was before the wall was built separating Gaza and Israel. The Thanksgiving dinner was to be held at the hospital, which had been founded by Anglicans, but was being run by Southern Baptists. It was a teaching hospital with a school of nursing. While we were there, I was invited to participate in a Bible study with some nursing students. All the nursing students were Arab males, men from Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Gaza. There were seven students at the Bible study, each of whom had accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. They all told me they had been disowned by their families because they had embraced the Christian faith. One student from right there in Gaza could not go back home. He said he was dead to his father because he had converted to Christianity. His father told him the day he set foot on his property, he would kill him. At the time, I remember thinking that I had not made any kind of sacrifice like that. I grew up in the Christian faith, would I have been able to leave my family like 
they did to follow Christ. Jesus is being honest and kind to warn that large crowd following him that they might need to stop and count the cost. Like a builder getting ready to build a tower or a general getting ready to lead troops into battle against a larger army, Jesus says you need to stop and count the cost. You may have to make a choice deciding between family and Jesus or between Jesus and your possessions or even between Jesus and your life. Do you take your loyalty to Christ seriously enough to make those kind of choices? Most of us don't think it will cost us much to be a Christian. After all, the average Methodist gives about 2% of his or her income to all charitable causes, including the church. Would we be willing to walk away from all our possessions to follow Christ? Most of us have not been put in that position. The worst we might face is the pastor making us feel guilty if we don't want to give money to hurricane victims or to the down and out or getting a pledge card in the mail that asks us to give more this year than we gave last year. Jesus warns us that it could cost us much more. Sometimes people are upset, sometimes even Christians, when family members make sacrifices for Christ. When Yvonne and I were planning to go to Brazil as missionaries, our family members tried to discourage us. They tried to convince us that we should stay in this country and not, so, not give up so much for others. Several years ago, when Will Willimon was dean of the chapel at Duke University, he got a call from a very upset parent, a very upset father. I hold you personally responsible for this, he said. Me? Will asked. The father was hot, upset because his graduate student-bound daughter had just informed him that she was going to throw it all away and go do mission work with the Presbyterians in Haiti. Isn't that absurd, shouted the father. A BS degree in mechanical engineering from Duke and she's going to dig ditches in Haiti? Will responded, well, I doubt she's received much training in the engineering department here for that kind of work, but she's probably a fast learner and will probably get the hang of ditch digging in a few months. Look, said the father, this is no laughing matter. You're completely irresponsible to have encouraged her to do this. I hold you personally responsible. As the conversation went on, Dr. Willimon pointed out that the well-meaning but obviously unprepared parents were the ones who had started the ball rolling. They were the ones who had baptized her, had her baptized, and they read Bible stories to her. They took her to Sunday school, let her go with the Presbyterian Youth Fellowship to ski and veil. Will said, you're the one who introduced her to Jesus, not me. But all we ever wanted her to be was a Presbyterian, said the father. It's probably a lot easier to be a Presbyterian or a Methodist than to be all in as a follower of Jesus Christ. As we grow in our discipleship, may our love for God and our loyalty to Christ grow. What is the most important commandment according to Jesus? He says in Matthew, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. What happens when obeying the first commandment to love God conflicts with the second commandment, to love my neighbor. That would be rare, wouldn't it? But that is exactly what Jesus is talking about. Some Christians throughout the ages have been forced to choose between the two greatest commandments when it was impossible to do both. Chiyune Sujihara was born on January the 1st, 1900. As a boy, he cherished the dream of becoming the Japanese ambassador to Russia. By the 1930s, he was the ambassador to Lithuania, just a step away from Russia. One morning, a huge throng of people gathered outside his home. They were Jews who had made their way across treacherous terrain from Poland, desperately seeking his help. They wanted Japanese visas, which would enable them to flee Eastern Europe and the Gestapo. Three times, Sujihara wired Tokyo for permission to provide the visas. 
Three times he was rejected. He had to choose between the fulfillment of his dream as an ambassador and taking care of his family and people's lives. He chose the latter. He dared to disobey orders. For 28 days, he wrote visas by hand, barely sleeping and eating. Recalled to Berlin, he was still writing visas and shoving them out through the train windows into the hands of the refugees who ran alongside. Ultimately, he saved 6,000 lives. Sujihara was not only a courageous Japanese man, he was also a committed Christian. And when he returned to Japan, he was dismissed from the foreign service because of his disobeying direct orders. He spent his remaining days in Japan humbly selling light bulbs and doing odd jobs. When his story was finally told, his son was asked, how did your father feel about his choice? The young man replied, my father's life was fulfilled. When God needed him to do the right thing, he was available to do it. Jesus says we must be willing to sacrifice everything if we follow him. Jesus draws a picture of discipleship from the military. To be a soldier means going into battle, risking your life. Soren Kierkegaard said that there are a lot of parade ground Christians who wear the uniforms of Christianity, but few who are willing to risk their lives in the battle for Christ and his kingdom. When it comes to doing battle for the Lord, too many church members are just sitting on the premises rather than standing on the promises of God. Jesus says, if you choose to follow him, it may cost you everything. You better count the cost. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for being honest about the choices we need to make. It's so hard to even fathom having to make such a choice. We are here because we love you. And we love our families and friends as you have taught us. We're also very fond of the money and possessions we have and don't want to let go of them. And we certainly don't want to give up our lives. Lord, help us reset our priorities by putting you first. We thank you for the thousands who have given everything because they loved you that much. They inspire us with their courage, their sacrifice, and their dedication to you. Fill us with the love that Jesus has for us the same love that motivated him to lay down his life for us. May we offer ourselves as living sacrifices for you each day, putting our love for you as our first priority. In the name of the one who suffered on the cross for us and was raised to new life, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.